please notice that in the back of the pews you should be able to find a guest stand. If you'll fill that out, put that in the offer button, come find the bulletin for whatever you're busy. We really appreciate that. Now it's time for our children who would like to. We can go to Kids Zone, our children's church, or kindergarten through fifth grade, and head this way. And follow this Andy. There you go. All right, and everybody else, please welcome each other this morning.
that is ours in you. The hope you have given us. Something that's solid, something that's firm, that's not based on wishful thinking, that's beyond that, the solid foundation of who you are and what you've done and what you've promised us. We praise you. And Father, help us to remember this. As we go into the rest of the week, like every week, we're going to get bombarded with all sorts of different voices trying to make us scared about this, scared about that. Father, help us to walk with you. Help us every day to carve out time for you, Lord. So we can remember what the truth is. We can remember who you are. Who we are in you. And what your purpose is for each of us. Father, we praise you for the glorious destiny that you have safeguarded for us. We praise you, Lord, that we are looking forward to an eternal glory that far outweighs any present day. We praise you that those are not empty platitudes or mere words. Precious is truth. So we have hope. Lord, I pray that in Jesus that you can help each of us to be very attentive this week to the people around us. So many folks struggling in so many different ways. Some of us right here in this room facing some things that sure look scary from our perspective. Father, help us to support one another, to encourage one another, to carry one another's burdens. We pray that you would help each of us follow to hold on to the hope that we have in you. To share that with each other, especially in times of life. Follow me also pray for something that's happening all the way on the other side of the world right now. That rescue operation happening in Thailand. Where you've got the soccer team and, and the coach there that have been and trapped in a cave for over two weeks. Father, we pray that you would be in God that rescue effort. Lord, I read just for the service that uh, three of the boys have already been brought out safe and sound, and we praise you for that. We pray that the rest of that team, the coach too, would be taken to safety, Lord. We pray that through this whole experience, they, the families, and, and all the people involved in this, even the rescuers, that all of them would be drawn closer to you. And would come out of this with a deeper faith in you, Lord. I'm sure there's many of them that don't even know you. There may be some of them that don't have never heard the name of Jesus. Father, I pray some way, somehow, that you would be glorified through this. So we do pray, Father, that you would rescue those boys, rescue the church, rescue the divers as they lay their lives on the line for us. Thank you, Father. We praise you.
father was so thankful that we can be in your house this morning. We thank you for loving us, for showering us with blessings. We ask you to forgive us of our sins, wash us white as snow. We thank you for the opportunity to give back to you a portion that you have allowed us to earn. Help us, Lord, to be grateful, to be thankful. Help us, the church, to use the funds in ways to share the good news to those who are lost. We thank you for the day that you've given us. Help us to use it and to thank you for the precious opportunity. In your precious name we pray. Amen. chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We've been gradually working our way through the book of Romans for a long time. We're still in the middle of chapter 12, so please turn there. That's page 803 in the Bibles in the pews. Romans 12 and We'll start in verse 9 and we'll read a few, ver a few verses we've already worked through. Then we'll read today's verse. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 9. There the Apostle Paul writes this. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. And now we come to today's verse. Be joyful in hope, 
patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Would you describe yourself as being a joyful person? Are you a joyful person? Would your friends and family describe you as being a joyful person? If not, if you're sitting there and you're thinking, okay, probably there's not too many people that are going to mistake me for being a joyful person. If that's you, do you have hope? Do you have hope? The title of today's sermon is Got Hope? The Apostle Paul tells us that we should be joyful in hope. Joyful in hope. We're to be joyful in hope because, as the note sheet that's provided in the bulletin there, the first note on the note sheet says, there is no way to be truly joyful apart from hope. If we don't have hope, we're not going to have any joy. Joy is a byproduct of hope. Now, we need to be real clear right from the start, what is hope? Because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what hope truly is these days. People often use the, the word hope to describe wishful thinking. Is this or that good thing going to happen? I don't know. I hope so. But I don't know. See, in that sense, hope is just wishful thinking. But in the biblical sense of the word, hope uh, is something that goes far beyond wishful thinking. Hope is an internal, confident expectancy based on an external truth. I know that's a mouthful, so let me repeat that again. Hope is an internal, confident expectancy that's based on an external truth. In other words, it's not based on me. It's not based on my preferences or my desires or my wishes. It's on something far stronger than myself. It's based on an external truth. Or another way to put it would be this, and I put this on the note sheet. Hope is found not in what we wish to be true, but in what we know to be true. See the difference? The way we usually word the, use the word hope is just what we wish to be true. Well, I hope that happens. It's just wishful thinking. But real hope, biblical hope, is not found in what we wish to be true. It's found in what we know to be true. So let me ask you again, with that definition in mind, do you have hope? Many, many people these days are starving for hope. I'm going to read uh, uh, part of an article to you from a fellow named John Stone Street. He's the president for the Charles Colson Center for Christian Worldview. Fantastic organization. You can go to find their website, breakpoint.org. They have a, a podcast they put out five or six times a week. I highly encourage you to listen to those podcasts. I cannot give a higher recommendation for the Chuck Colson Center for Christian Worldview and breakpoint.org. Fantastic stuff. John Stone Street, just a few weeks ago, wrote this. He says, the CDC, that's the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC reported that between 1999 and 2016, suicide rates in all but one state in the U.S. across age, gender, and ethnic lines increased. Suicides, in fact, are the second leading cause of death for people ages 15 to 34. Isn't that staggering? Throw in other deaths of despair, such as drug overdoses and complications from alcoholism. And we have a public health crisis of the first order. Given the state of our culture, he continues, it's not surprising. People seem more isolated than ever before, despite, or perhaps in part because of, being more virtually connected. Loneliness and depression are epidemic and rising, and the mediating institutions of communities, like families, churches, civic organizations, are struggling, to say the least. Social ties are fraying at an astonishing pace, and then he sums it up with this statement. In our society, it's increasingly difficult for individuals to be spiritually, mentally, 
and emotionally healthy. Would you agree with that assessment? In recent months and years, we've even had quite a few celebrities commit suicide. I think it's easier to understand when a person when the person committing suicide is someone whose life appears to have just fallen apart. It's easier to understand that. It's but when people when they seem to have everything that the world chases after, when they've got wealth, fame, success, when those people commit suicide. It's shocking. And it's a strong reminder that no matter how much money or awards or popularity a person has, if he or she does not have a solid basis for hope, then it's just not enough. Remember, hope is not merely wishful thinking. It's something based on solid reality and external truth. As the next note on the note sheet says, hope is absolutely necessary for human flourishing. It's absolutely necessary. Just the way that we humans are created, just the way we're wired, part of the fuel, the necessary fuel we run on, is hope. You've got to have it. We won't fully engage in living unless we have hope. Leadership guru John Maxwell tells the story of a small town of Flagstaff, Maine that was chosen as the site of a large hydroelectric power plant. In the spring of 1950, a dam was built across the river there and the town of Flagstaff, what, what was the town, was submerged under the waters of the lake. And before they did this, of course, many months before, they let the people know what was happening. They gave them ample time to prepare and get things in order and make the necessary adjustments. Because the lake was coming and the town was going to be gone. Now during those months leading up to the installation of that dam and the submergence of the town, during those months leading up to that, an odd thing happened in the town. I guess it's not so odd when you think about it. But all improvements in the town ceased. No painting was done. What was the use of painting a house if that house was going to be underwater in six months? No repairs were made on the buildings, on the roads, on the sidewalks. Day by day, the whole town got shabbier and shabbier. And a long time before the waters even came, the town looked uncared for and abandoned. Even though many of the people... We're still living in the town. As one citizen of the town put it, and I put this on the note sheet, one of them said, where there is no faith in the future, there is no power in the present. Where there's no faith in the future, there is no power in the present. Flagstaff, Maine was a town without faith in the future. It was a town without hope. Where there's no faith in the future, there's no power in the present. You know, that's not a bad definition of hope. Faith in the future. A firm conviction that everything really is going to be all right. It's going to be okay. In the Nazi concentration camps of World War II, the survival rate of the prisoners was incredibly low. As a matter of fact, did you know that if you were a prisoner in a concentration camp in World War II, your chance of survival was you had a 1 in 28 chance of survival. Out of every 28 people that went into a concentration camp, only one survived. Terribly low survival rates. Psychiatrist Viktor Frankl, some of you might recognize that name, he was one of the very few who survived being a prisoner in the no notorious camp Auschwitz. So here you have this psychiatrist, this person who 
His specialty is understanding why people do what they do. And he's placed in an unimaginable, unimaginable situation with people doing unimaginable things to each other. In his thought-provoking book, Man's Search for Meaning, Frankel discusses why some in the camp survived and some did not. And he said that the survivors were the ones who found some way to hold on to hope. In that book, he wrote this. He said, the prisoner who had lost faith in the future, his future, was doomed. With his loss of belief in the future, he also lost his spiritual hold. He let himself decline and became subject to mental and physical decay. One of the stories that Viktor Frankl writes about in that book is one of his friends in the camp was a man who, before the war, had been a prof professional musician and a very well educated, very accomplished person. But in the concentration camp, I mean, everyone was just broken down, and he had been in the camp with this man for a couple of years. And one day the guy came to him, and he was just bubbling over with excitement. And, and Frankel asked him, What's going on? And he said, Victor. I had this dream. It's it, just this vivid, real dream. And, and in the dream, I heard a voice say to me that I and all of us would be set free on March 30th. That's the day, Victor. Now, when he told Victor Frankel this, it was the very beginning of March. So as the, the next few weeks came by, that man, he's just exuberant. He's bubbling over with an energy that Victor Frankel hadn't seen in him in years. March 30th came and went. There was no freedom. There was no relief. There was no deliverance. And the man had pinned all his hope on that day. And Viktor Frankl wrote, the very next day, March 31st, the man died. Because when that day came and went, he had pinned all his hope on what this voice in his dream had told him. Obviously, it wasn't God. It didn't turn out to be true. But when he lost all hope, his body just gave out. He was done. When a person doesn't have faith in the future, it can be debilitating, even life-ending. But when a person does have faith in the future, when a, when a person does have hope, it can be life-giving. Years ago, I came across this story about how a school system in a large city had a program to help children keep up with their schoolwork if a child had to stay for a while in one of the city's hospitals. One day, a teacher who was assigned to that program received a routine call asking her to visit a particular child. She took the child's name and room number and she talked briefly with the child's regular class teacher. And the child's regular teacher said, we're studying nouns and adverbs in his class now. And I'd be grateful if you could help him understand them so he doesn't fall too far behind. The hospital program teacher went to see the boy that afternoon. But no one had mentioned to her that the boy was there because he had been very badly burned. He was in a very critical condition, and he was in tremendous pain. And when she saw the boy in his condition, it was jarring. It was very upsetting to her, but she pulled herself together, and she said to the boy, she said, I've been sent by your school to help you with nouns and adverbs. And so she launched into the lesson, and she tried to teach the boy as best she could, even though he wasn't very responsive. And when she left that day, she felt that she really hadn't accomplished all that much. But the next day, when she came back to work with the boy again, one of the nurses in the ward walked up to her and she asked the teacher, what did you do to that boy? And the lady, you know, she assumed obviously something bad had happened. She said, I, I didn't do anything. I, I just took him through his lesson. And the nurse said, no, 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 you don't understand. We've been worried about that little boy because he's not been making any progress. But ever since yesterday, his whole attitude has changed. He's fighting back. He's responding to treatment. It's like he's decided to live. 
When they finally asked the boy about this, which was about two weeks later, they didn't, they didn't ask him just then, they let him gain his strength back a bit. And when they finally asked, okay, you made a serious positive turn, what, what caused that? The boy explained that he had completely given up hope until the teacher arrived. Everything changed when he came to a simple realization. And here's how he put it. This is what he said. They wouldn't send a teacher to work on nouns and adverbs with a dying boy, would they? They must think, I'm going to live. And that changed his whole perspective. Even though the teacher may not have even realized it, what she did just by being there and teaching him the lesson, it gave him hope. And hope gave him life. As we've been, you know, following the story of those boys trapped in that cavern over in Thailand, one of the things that's gone through my mind, you know, since I've been preparing this sermon, is I hope that they're doing something to give those boys and that coach hope. Hope is absolutely necessary for human flourishing. As a matter of fact, hope is a crucial part of our walk with God. As we're about to see, it's foundational to who we are as followers of Jesus. For example, the Apostle Paul writing in Colossians chapter 1. Paul in Colossians 1 wrote this. He said, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that, watch this, spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you've already heard in the true message of the gospel. The faith and love that spring from the what? Hope that's stored up for you in heaven. Our faith in Jesus, that is our willingness to trust him, and our love for others both spring from, they both bubble up from, our hope. And what hope is that? The hope stored up for us in heaven. The hope stored up for us in heaven. And what hope is stored up for us in heaven? The solid reality of eternal life with and in Almighty God. As the note she says, in Jesus... We have a destiny that is indescribably wonderful. In Jesus, and this isn't just wishful thinking. We have the solid reality, a promise from Almighty God, of a glorious destiny that's indescribably wonderful. Do you remember when Jesus' friend Lazarus died? And Jesus intentionally shows up late with his disciples, and the man's been dead for four days, and his sister Martha runs out to talk to Jesus, and she's like, Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died, and she's all torn up. And then Jesus says this, this is John 11, says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do we believe that? Do we? Do we know that? How do we know that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? Remember, hope is not about what we wish is true. Hope is what we know is true. So how do we know that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? Well, we know it because Jesus himself rose from the dead, right? He was tortured, crucified, killed and buried on a Friday. And then on Sunday morning, he rose from the dead with an indestructible body that could never die again. Amen indeed. Now, how do we know that? That's the story, right? How do we know that's true? We know that because there were over five hundred eyewitnesses who saw him after his resurrection. And they didn't just catch a glimpse out of the corner of their eye. Oh, I think I saw Jesus. I think that was Jesus over there. That's not how it was. 
They actually talked with him. They actually ate meals with him. They hung out with him over and over for a period of 40 days. For over a month, they had extended conversations with him and interacted with him. And after Jesus ascended back to heaven, they went around telling people that they had seen the risen Christ. Now, why should we believe they were telling the truth? How do we know that? How do we know that what they were claiming was true? Well, because many of them endured serious persecution and loss because of telling others about Jesus. Many of them were even eventually killed because of their claim that Jesus had risen from the dead and was Lord of all creation. Here's the thing. None of them changed their story in an effort to avoid being killed. If it was just a lie, you would think that at least some of them would have said to their executioners, whoa, 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 hold on. No, it, it, it's a lie. Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. We just thought it'd be fun to invent a new religion. It's a hoax. You know, don't kill me. Don't kill me. But none of them said that. Instead, they went to their graves claiming, it doesn't matter what you do to me. You can crucify me. You can chop off my head. You can skin me alive. But it's not going to change the fact that I was there and I saw Jesus risen from the dead. And you've got to understand, they weren't dying for a belief. All sorts of people die for beliefs. They were dying claiming that they had actually personally experienced an event. Do you see the difference there? They didn't die claiming, I believe Jesus rose from the dead. They're, they're, they died claiming, look, I don't understand it either. I don't know how God did it, but he did it. Jesus was alive, and it doesn't matter what you do to me, it's not going to change it. I was there. That's a very different thing. Do you really think that these people would have suffered so much loss and some of them even given their lives for something that they knew wasn't really true? Would you have done that? Would you sacrifice so much and give your life for something that you knew? It's not true. I wouldn't. And I, I, it's nonsensical for me to think that they would have either. Who does that? If it's just one or two people, you could write it off as, well, they were just crazy, but it wasn't just one or two people. They had hope that went far beyond this world because they knew that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Their hope was much more than wishful thinking. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1, if you would please, and let's take a look at another passage about the hope we have in the risen Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1, page 857 in the Bibles in the Pews. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. There we read from the Apostle Peter. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice. Though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you've not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The hope. The joy that we have because of the certainty we have of the promises of God and the reality of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. 
A salvation that is coming. Let's look at one, one expression, one description of part of what that salvation is like. Turn with me to the end of the Bible. Go to Revelation chapter 21. All the way back toward the end of the Bible. Revelation chapter 21, let's begin there in the first verse. The Apostle John receives this amazing vision from God. Here's what he writes. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look! God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Folks, I know that the world looks dark. I know that you look around at the news and it seems like evil has the upper hand. But guys, I've read the back of the book and guess what? God wins. God wins. You know, I've heard some preachers say, I've read the back of the book and we win. Uh-uh. God wins. And we only share in that victory if we are with God. If we have surrendered our lives to him and we have invited Jesus in as Lord and Savior, then we share in that victory. God will have the last word. The last word will not be death. The last word will not be destruction. The last word will be life. The last word will be Jesus. We have hope. Remember that the Apostle Paul taught us that, as the note sheet says, our faith in Christ Jesus and our love for others spring from the hope that we have in heaven. Our faith in Christ Jesus, our love for others spring from the hope that we have in heaven. Now, sometimes I have had conversations with non-Christians where they'll push back against this in this way. What they'll say is, you, you Christians are so heavenly minded that you are of no earthly good. I've had even other Christians say, Kevin, we shouldn't focus on heaven too much. Because if you focus on heaven, people will get it in their heads. Well, we don't really have to work hard and serve others and, and do like what you guys are going to be doing this week with Kentucky Changers. We don't have to inconvenience ourselves because God's going to, he's going to fix it all one day anyway. So we can just sit back and relax and not take adventurous risks for God and on behalf of caring for others because God's going to fix it all anyway. And so they'll say, don't focus on heaven. Nothing could be more unbiblical. That view is a, is a distortion of how the hope of heaven really transforms and empowers the followers of Jesus. As C.S. Lewis wrote, if you look throughout history, what you find is quite the opposite. It is the Christians who are the most heavenly minded who do tend to be of the most earthly good. For example, in the first few centuries after the resurrection of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus occurred somewhere around 30 AD. In the first few centuries after this, Christians uh, endured waves of persecution and oppression and yet their numbers grew and grew and grew. Within 300 years, it was the most uh, popular faith in the Roman Empire. And one, just one, of the many reasons that so many people began putting their faith in Jesus was because of the, listen to this word, fearless love of the Christians. Fearless love of the Christians. Here's what I mean. In the ancient world, it wasn't uncommon for plagues to sweep through various regions. And since they had very little effective medicine, there really wasn't much they could do about it. When a plague hit a city, you just had to endure it. And what would happen is, the healthy people would pretty much all leave. Even the doctors. 
Even the doctors, because they knew there was nothing they could do. So if you want to save your life, you just get out of there. And you would wind up that the people left behind, for the most part, were just the sick and dying. But in that, in that context, those plague-filled cities, the Christians, while everyone else was fleeing the plague cities, the Christians were actually going into the cities or staying in the cities to care for the sick and dying. Now, as you might expect, some of the Christians survived these rescue missions, and some of their patients did. But some of them died from the plague. And what that showed is that they weren't immune to this. This was a real risk. They were making a real sacrifice by, by doing this, and yet they were still doing it. They were still going into the cities. The Christians' willingness to risk their lives to take care of others had a powerful, positive impact in the eyes of the non-Christians. Christians became known as, listen to this, the people who do not fear death. The people who do not fear death. When the non-Christians saw the Christians' love for others and their fearlessness in the face of death, the non-Christians became much more open to talking about this Jesus that the Christians were following. And many of them became followers of Jesus too. The Christian's fearlessness and love for others sprang from the hope they had in heaven, their eternal destiny in Jesus Christ. So don't buy into this thing of, well, we shouldn't focus on heaven too much because that means that'll keep us from serving. That's ridiculous. It is our hope in heaven that should set us free to be fearless even in the face of, of risk and, sacri and sacrifice and danger. Because of the hope we have in the risen Lord Jesus, we too should be fearless in the face of death and willing to lay our lives on the line to communicate the love of God to others. Do you fear death? Do you have hope? I remember years ago hearing a, one of my elderly Christian friends We've been walking with the Lord for many, many, many decades, longer than I've been alive. I was visiting her in the hospital, and I happened to mention something about, well, I'm so sorry to see you lying here in the hospital. You know, I'm sorry you're in this situation. She said, well, it beats the alternative. And what she meant by that statement is, could be worse, I could be dead. It beats the alternative. And I'm sitting there, and I didn't say anything. I just kind of smiled and nodded like pastors do. But I was thinking, I... No, I Nope, I don't believe that. It doesn't beat the alternative. Now, I understand not wanting to die. I don't want to die. I don't want to be a tremendous hardship on my wife, on my kids, on my family. I don't want to die. But when my family's taken care of, my kids are grown, and they're off doing their thing, and my wife has already gone on to glory because I wouldn't want her to have to... Well, maybe it would bless you to deal without me. I don't know. I, I'm assuming... She, yeah, she's, she's like, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> but when my time comes, I mean, you know, maybe it'll seem different when it's there, but the alternative, if the alternative is death for the Christian, the alternative is amazing. Do you fear death? Now, I know that some people may be listening to this saying, Kevin, it's not death that worries me. It's all that might happen between now and then that worries me. Death isn't so bad. It's dying that can be really bad, right? Yeah, I understand. But we need to remember that Paul said that not only does our love for others spring from the hope we have in us, but also our faith in Christ Jesus. Our faith in him, our trust in him springs from that same hope in him. Our willingness to trust God day in and day out is based on our hope in Him. Hope in God is not just for the hereafter. Hope in God is for whatever is happening right here, right now. It's the source of our strength to face these things. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this to us. He said, so don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. 
But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Now how's that for promise? He will give you everything you need. You say, yeah, but what about my wants? He's not going to give all your wants to you. He's not. Why? Because it wouldn't be good for you. You and I are sinful fallen people and we have a tendency to want things that are unhealthy. So God's not going to give you all your wants. But he does promise to give us all that we need. He says, don't worry. Don't worry. In John chapter 16, Jesus said this. He said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. Thank you for that promise, Jesus. We appreciate that. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. What Christianity is, some people get the mistaken notion that if you become a follower of Jesus and you become a Christian, that that's some sort of get out of suffering free card that you get to carry with you where nothing bad's ever going to happen to you, everything's going to be fine. That's not biblical. There's nothing biblical about that. What the Word tells us, what God's Word tells us, is that in Jesus, since He has overcome the world, we live in Him, He lives in us, that no matter what happens... No matter what you and I face, we will have a power source, a person living inside of us, the Holy Spirit of God, who can and will carry us through no matter what. And, and will get us to the other side. There is nothing bad that you and I can ever face that is eternal except separation from God. Hell. Hell. But if you're walking with the Lord, if the Lord Jesus lives in you and you live in him, you don't have to worry about that. Well, what else is there to worry about? Hey, <laughs> it's funny for me to say this to you because I feel like a hypocrite. Because I worry. But why? Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. There is nothing that you and I can ever face that's going to make God go, whoa. I don't know what to do with this. Oh my goodness, God's just wringing his hands. He's, he's, hey, all right, group meeting, angels gather around, brainstorming. What can we do for Ethan? Ethan's in a situation that's just, whoa, what are we going to do? God doesn't do that. He never does that, ever. There's nothing that you have ever faced or that I have ever faced or we ever will face that makes God intimidated. God is almighty. His love for you is unfailing and unwavering. His power is inexhaustible. And he knows how to deliver us. He knows. Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. The world's not bigger than God. The universe is not bigger than God. The Apostle Peter, 1 Peter 5.10, he says, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ... After you have suffered a little while, see that admission that, yeah, we all go through rough things. After you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Or how about this one, one of our favorite verses, Romans 8, 28, the Apostle Paul wrote, And we know, not, and we wish, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to to his purpose. Everything you and I are walking through, and if we love him, if we're surrendered to him, he's going to pull good out of all of it. Just a few verses later in the very same chapter in Romans 8, Paul wrote, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? And he faced all these things, by the way. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. The image there is the image of a sacrifice. Offering our lives as sacrifices. All these things happen to him and yet he says, no. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. My brothers and sisters, we 
have hope. We have hope. Hope for today, tomorrow, and forever. A few months ago, I was talking with my next door neighbor. We're standing out by my, my mailbox and we're having a conversation. And, and this is a, a very elderly gentleman who, bless his heart, does not yet believe in God. And we're, we've had some good conversations and I've given him some reading material. And I'm trying, but so far he's not crossed that frontier. But we're talking, and, and he, we were talking about the state of the world. And all this stuff going on, and he was so worried. He just said that he's absolutely discouraged. Having lived as long as he's lived and seen so many things, he's to a place where he's so discouraged. And he looked at me and he said, Kevin, you have young children. How can you have hope? And I said, how can I have hope? I believe in God. I believe in God. You see, as the note sheet says, where God is, there's always hope. Where God is, there's always hope. Do you believe that? You might say, well, Kevin, unlike your neighbor, I'm not worried about the future of the world. I'm worried about the future of my marriage. I don't know if we're going to make it. Well, listen. Have you invited God into it? Have you invited him into your home, into your situation? Have you invited him into your life? Are you ardently trying to submit to his way, doing things his, his way, the way he wants you to do them? Because what happens is, when you do that, God, God's not a tyrant. He's not going to force his way into your situation. But if you welcome him like that, he's going to come in. And wherever God is, there's always hope. There's always hope. And that's no promise that your marriage will survive because there are two people involved in that and your spouse may not turn to God. But the hope is this. There's hope for the marriage. The marriage can be saved. But even if it isn't, even if it isn't, nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. And he will not abandon you. He's overcome the world and he knows how to carry you through that beyond the pain and bring you to a place of restoration and healing. And I say that because I've lived it, and I know. These aren't just words. That's my story. Where God is, there's always hope. You may be saying, man, what I'm dealing with is I, I don't have hope with, with the job, with my finances. It looks hopeless. Well, have you invited God into it? Have you welcomed him into your decision-making in regard to employment, your financial decision-making? Have you really said, God, you come in and you just act like God. You be God. Let's do things your way instead of my way. Because see what most of the time we do is we'll say, God, I'm in a mess. I've got all these problems financially. Please fix it. And what we really mean is I want you to fix it the way I think it ought to be fixed. The way that leads to what I want my life to look like, fulfilling whatever desires I've pinned my hopes on. That doesn't work. If we're going to invite God in, we have to do it on his terms, not ours, because guess what? He's God. We're not. So if you're really going to walk with him, you've got to treat him like who he is, God. That means he comes in and he calls the shots. Okay, God, I'm going to take the plans I had for my employment, my finances, and all that stuff, and I'm just going to just lay it all down and let it burn on the altar. It's done. It's gone. What do you want to do? I'll do whatever you want to do. When you invite God in, what he does is he starts working things around for your good. Where God is, there's always hope. God brings victory out of defeat. He brings life out of death. He's good at this. He's had a lot of practice. He knows what he's doing. Why don't we trust him? Romans 12, 12, we'll end where we began. The Apostle Paul wrote this. He said, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer because of the present and eternal hope we have in Jesus Christ we can be joyful Christians should be the most joyful people around not because we're ignoring reality but because we're totally in tune with reality are we joyful if we're not joyful shame on us shame on us guys Jesus lives 
And we live too in him eternally. We can be joyful in hope. We can be patient in affliction because there's not a thing you and I are ever going to go through that's terrible that is eternal other than hell. So if you've submitted to Jesus, you, you've turned to him, guess what? All the bad things you'll ever go through are only temporary. Only temporary. I remember talking with an elderly friend of mine. She was talking about her aches and pains. Uh, as, you know, she's pretty advanced in years. And I said, you know, isn't it good that old age only happens once? Some of you that might sound callous like I was minimizing or making fun of her. I wasn't at all. I was totally serious. And she responded that way. She said, yes, thank God that's true. She knew exactly what I was talking about. We can be patient in affliction. We can be faithful in prayer. We can do these things not because of what we wish to be true, but because of what we know to be true because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead and because of the eternal promises that have been given to us by Almighty God who does not lie. If I was holding a microphone, it'd be mic drop. Boom. <laughs> do you have hope? If not, have you been forgetting the solid foundation that we have for our hope? Do you personally know the God of hope? Have you invited him into your life? He's already invited you. He's already invited you. Have you responded to his invitation by saying, yes, Lord, come on in? Have you trusted him, trusted Jesus as your Savior, submitted your life to him as, as your Lord? Does Jesus live in you? Do you live in him? Because, guys, where God is, there's always hope. Always. I want to ask you to please stand and ask the musicians to take their places. We're going to enter into a time of invitation. I don't know what the Lord might be uh, saying to you. He's, he could be saying to many of us, Hey, you down there, doing all that worrying. Cut it out. Stop it. Trust me. Whatever the Lord's saying to you, I invite you to, to just respond. If you need to make a public, uh, public uh, decision of whatever kind, I'll be here to receive you. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the solid hope we have in you. Help us to get beyond the world's game of letting hope be nothing more than wishful thinking. We know that your son rose from the dead. We know that you have carried us through. We could go down these pews and hear story after story after story of how you've been faithful, Lord. And you carried so many of us through things that we thought we'd never make it through. And yet you did it. Where you are, there's always hope. Hope for today, for tomorrow, for eternity. Set us free to live in joy. Set us free to serve others fearlessly. Help us to be the people you created and called us to be. People of hope. People of joy and faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.